Hello. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Jim Gifford, and I work at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and the Research and Development Directorate. I lead a team that goes out to Department of Defense war games and supports nuclear play within those war games. Uh, part of our job is to go out and raise the nuclear awareness for soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines um, and what it would be like if a nuclear weapon were used on the battlefield, dispelling a lot of the myths and overestimation. First off, let's talk about nuclear weapons and what happens when a nuclear we weapon detonates. Uh, as you can see in the slide, we have an amazingly look cool looking fireball and mushroom cloud. This is what you will see typically after a nuclear detonation. Um, and within, when that weapon detonates, 50% of the energy coming out of that weapon is blast effects. Traditional explosive blasts and pressure waves that we see from traditional explosives. You also get 35% of the energy coming out as thermal energy. It's a pulse of infrared radiation that is very, extremely hot and moves at the speed of light. 15% comes out as nuclear radiation. This is gammas and neutrons, gamma ray radiation and neutron radiation. Um, about 5% of that 15 comes out as prompt radiation immediately after the detonation. And the residual 10% stays as residual radiation that typically is known as fallout. There is a small sliver of radiation that comes out in what is known as electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. Uh, it's really between 0.1 to 0.5% of the weapon, but again, a very small percentage of the detonation energy. So just to kind of put this in perspective, we're going to look at the Hiroshima bomb that was dropped um, during World War II. Right? It was roughly 15 kilotons. And when we say kilotons throughout this presentation, that's talking the equivalent of thousands of tons of TNT or dynamite. So when that weapon detonated, 180 meters around that detonation point was the fireball, and everything inside of that was vaporized. The fireball is estimated to be about 100 million degrees Celsius. Um, so it will turn anything, even soil, steel, to an instant, instantly to a vapor. About 1.1 meters out um, in a radius, uh, a spherical radius from the detonation location, you have heavy blast damage. So your buildings, concrete buildings are going to be damaged, potentially demolished, definitely structurally unsound. Uh, about 1.2 kilometers out will be the prompt nuclear radiation, uh, where people will likely get a, a fatal dose and die within a month or so. And out to about 1.9 kilometers is that thermal radiation, that thermal pulse, can ignite most anything out, that dis out at that distance, as well as um, cause third degree burns on exposed skin of personnel in the open. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about here in this, in this uh, briefing. Uh, now we will not be talking about the megaton or very large nuclear weapons. We're going to be looking at what we can typically call a low yield nuclear weapon, closer to 100 kilotons or less. Now first we're going to look at some uh, interesting testing videos. Uh, this first video comes from uh, the Operation Teapot Shot B, um, and it was uh, done in 1955, March 22nd. This is an 8 kiloton blast, um, and the height of burst was about 150 meters. So when you watch this video, notice you will see the fireball forming. Um, it's almost instantaneous, and then you'll see it uh, expand out. Um, and if you watch very closely, you'll notice the fireball never contacts the ground because the pressure wave coming out bounces off the ground, keeps the fireball from touching the ground. That means this was a fallout-free height of burst. Uh, Low-yield uh, weapons will be functioning near the ground, so it will be hard to tell at the time of burst, did it ca um, cause fallout or not. And we'll talk about fallout shortly. All right, we have another uh, video to show you. Um, now, this video is a larger weapon at 29 kilotons, so almost twice the yield of what we dropped in Hiroshima. All right, again, height of burst around 150 meters. And now, the camera for this blast is set up about 1.4 kilometers um, from the detonation. And you'll see the, when the video starts, you'll see a very bright flash of light, which is indicative of a nuclear detonation. And the weapon will be actually functioning off to the left of the camera. Um, now, as soon as the dash or flash blindness uh, from the bright flash goes away, you'll see some telephone poles, all right, or power lines, um, and you'll notice very quickly how they look to uh, puff like smoke. Now that's the actual outer edge facing the blast of the uh, varnish and uh, just dirt on the side of that uh, 
uh, telephone pole becoming a vapor from that thermal pulse and you'll see it kind of expand and then as you watch you'll see the pressure wave come by a little while later kind of push all those cloud like telephone poles to the side and then you can eventually see about three seconds or so later the blast wave moving along the ground to the camera location and shake the camera. So the point of this video when you watch it is you can see that the thermal pulse along with the radiation, uh, the prompt radiation you can't see, is instantaneous because it moves at the speed of light. Whereas the pressure wave that comes out is, move, is a sound wave, much like lightning versus thunder, right? You're going to have that sound wave come a little bit while later. So you actually have time to get cover if you're far enough away from the blast wave, but that thermal pulse is instantaneous. The, the timing of the thermal and the uh, blast wave, uh, we'll kind of talk about that as we go through each of these effects individually. So first we're going to start with the thermal effect. This is the one that's going to hit you um, immediately and uh, um, will be the one you can kind of see, if you will, when it happens. Um, so again, the thermal energy travels at the speed of light because it is an electromagnetic wave or a light wave in the infrared spectrum. Um, for a 10 kiloton burst, it's about a second long pulse. Larger weapons, about 100 kilotons, it's about three seconds. Now, when a thermal pulse hits you or hits a person, you can have skin burns. So we're talking first degree, second degree, or third degree burns. Um, you have things set on fire. Um, you also have flash blindness or dazzle. Now that's kind of what you saw in that last video and it was very bright for a second and it took uh, about a second before you could actually see again. And that's what flash blindness actually is. Um, the best way I like to equate it is if you remember um, back if you went to the movies in the middle of the day, you walked out around 2 o'clock after a lunchtime movie from dark theater, you walk outside on a bright sunny day and your eyes are kind of bright and you kind of, ah, oh, it's really bright. That's exactly what flash blindness is like, just dialed up, you know, to 11 if you will. All right, and then finally you can get retinal burns. Now this is if you're looking directly at the blast when it happens. So when that weapon detonates, you're looking directly in that area. You actually get a portion of your vision that you will never get back because it will burn your retina. Likely you will not be completely blind. It'll be more like if you were a kid and you ever stared at the sun for a few seconds and you got that sunspot that went away after about a minute or so, just imagine that never going away. So it'll be a portion of your vision that you will never get back. Um, and just to show kind of uh, how bright this can really be, this is a picture back from some testing back in the 50s, um, an above ground test out in the Nevada test site from the old Vegas Strip. Now you can see it's not, um, you know, what we would consider Vegas these days, but you can see the what looks like a sunrise off in the distance. Now this was actually taken at night. Um, this was a nuclear test done at night, and that is actually the nuclear detonation going off over 60 miles away. And that's how bright the, this energy is that comes off this nuclear weapon. We have another image here of just some um, personnel watching the test of a nuclear weapon, again, off at a very safe distance, but you can see how bright that detonation actually is. So if a nuclear weapon were to go off, right, in a, in a future conflict, we would know it was a nuclear weapon just by the flash of light if you were in the near vicinity. Uh, so we have another uh, video here to watch. Um, this is a really cool old testing video of a house that's hit by uh, the thermal blast and then the air blast. So when you watch, you'll see, uh, it'll show it twice, um, you'll see the house and the, again the weapon is detonating off to the left side of the house. You'll see the front of the house will almost vaporize and that's the paint on the outside being vaporized by that thermal pulse. Uh, but the side and the back of the house are actually just fine and nothing happens to those from the thermal pulse. What this is showing is the thermal pulse is just like almost you can imagine shining a flashlight. So anything that's not in the shadows will be thermally burned. Anything in the shadows will be just fine. So you saw again the house, um, the front side thermally vaporized, right? The outside, the paint, the outside layer, and then the rest of the house was fine until the blast wave came and hit it. So again, that just shows that thermal effects are um, line of sight, uh, if you will. Um, so. What that means is if you are near a blast, if you are shielded or protected, not in the line of sight, you will likely have limited uh, thermal effects against you. So that means if you're in a vehicle, you're in a building, um, you're in a, in a foxhole, it turns out the ground is one of the best shielding uh, things for all the nuclear effects, um, you'll likely be okay. That includes being in a forest, right? If you're on the other side of a forest, the trees will keep you in the shadows, if you will, from the nuclear blast, and uh, you'll probably be okay. However, glass, like so if you're in an office building, glass uh, will not stop the uh, thermal 
uh, radiation and you will still get uh, burns. Uh, so you'll, you'll notice on the right I have a, a graph here of your distance from ground zero and the thermal fluence that you receive. Now if you didn't know this, when you get your PhD in a science field, uh, they do require that anytime you brief an audience you always have um, graphs and figures uh, or you lose your PhD. So in order to keep my PhD I wanted to point this out here that uh, what we're showing in this graph, the green curve that kind of drops down really quickly is for a 0.1 kiloton, right, or 100 tons nuclear detonation and the yellow curve is for a 10 kiloton detonation so 100 times larger in yield um, and you'll see there I have listed the uh, the values of thermal fluence that you get for third second and uh, first degree burns and I'll just point this out here by drawing some lines all right on the slide of where you get third degree burns for a 0.1 kiloton and a 10 kiloton and you'll notice that while I made my yield a hundred times larger I did not go out a hundred times further for my damage. It's a little less than ten times. All right. So what that's showing you, and, and all of these effects, I'll have a graph similar to this, just to point out that nuclear weapons effects don't scale linearly with the yield. So that means I can't multiply my yield a hundred times bigger and get a hundred times more damage. Right? The damage doesn't work that way. All right? It doesn't go out nearly that far. All right. Um, I will point out that for the flash blindness or the dazzle that I mentioned earlier and the retinal burns, it's much worse at night than at day, um, during the day, and you can see that there for 10 kilotons for both those effects. And that's just because it's a stark contrast, right, uh, of being daytime and then it's brighter versus very dark at night and then a very bright flash of light can actually uh, have effects further out. All right, so that's the thermal effects. Now we're going to move on to the other instantaneous or near instantaneous effect, prompt radiation. All right, so this is all the radiation, typically gamma, gamma ray radiation and neutron radiation received within the first minute of detonation near ground zero. Um, like uh, the thermal effect, you can have this reduced by shielding, however, you need a thick, very dense material like um, a metal vehicle, a very thickly armored metal, ve um, metal vehicle, thick concrete walls, or a foxhole. Again, the earth is a great uh, shielding mechanism for all the nuclear effects. Um, as you see there, your JSL suit or your, your MOP suit does not provide any meaning meaningful protection from radiation. It will go right through that. So you do need a dense, very har heavy armored vehicle to reduce um, the radiation that you will receive. Um, you'll see I've got another of my graphs over here again of the 0.1 kilotons in green, the 10 kilotons in yellow, and you'll see again it's not um, 100 times more in the range um, for that immediate capa incapacitation at 1,000 gray, right? Or, sorry, 1,000 centigrade. Um, and one of the key things with, unlike the thermal um, radiation that you will know immediately that, oh wow, it's really hot, I am in the thermal radiation zone. For the prompt radiation, this gamma ray radiation, you won't know right away unless you are basically right under the bomb and you're getting an extremely lethal dose, much more than a thousand centigrades. You won't know right away. And really the only way to know that you were exposed to radiation before you start exhibiting the symptoms is if you have a radiation meter on that is detecting that you were exposed. After, you, after the fact, it's really hard to figure out how much were you exposed to um, until you start exhibiting the symptoms. And then at that point, it's still hard to get a good estimation of what you had. So it's very important in an event where you think you might face a nuclear detonation that you have your, your dose meters, your radiation meters on and working um, before the blast happens. Um, so what we're going to talk about real quick is what happens if you are exposed to this um, lethal dose of radiation or potential lethal dose of radiation. So uh, this figure on the right is taken from um, an old Cold War doctrine, ATP 4-02.83, and it shows the percentage of lethality based on your dose if you have no medical intervention. And if you look at that graph, you, you see the 50 um, percent lethality on the on the left act or the y-axis and trace it across. You're going to see that the um, it crosses the curve roughly between 410 and about 450. All right, and what that means is if you get a dose of 410 um, or 450 centigrade, right, and it's a little wide, it's a wide uh, curve there due to the different uh, effects on, you know, people that are maybe not as in good of shape, right, they're going to be closer to 410 uh, children versus, you know, a really good in shape soldier is going to be closer to that 450 um, on the right. Um, what that's saying is if you get exposed to that much radiation, you could die, 50% of people will die if they have no medical intervention. Um, now we can 
help reduce the effects of radiation and potentially save your life around 410, uh, 450, even 500. Um, but once we start getting closer to 800 and above, there's really nothing we can do at that point medically to um, undo the radiation effects. Um, so if you are exposed to this large amount of radiation, you will get what's called acute radiation syndrome. And it's really um, noticeable by three phases. So you'll have your initial phase um, when the radiation first hits you and your body it will manifest by being nauseous, vomiting, you'll be very tired. Right? Um, kind of sounds like some other things that could happen to you, maybe not necessarily radiation, right? just getting the flu. Could be any of those things, right? Um, then your body's gonna recover from those initial symptoms. It's gonna fight those um, and, and get past the nausea and the vomiting. Um, and you'll have that latent phase where you think you've recovered. Oh, it wasn't that bad, I'll be okay. However, the damage is already done and it just the, the permanent um, fatal damage takes a little while to manifest, and that is um, usually happens a little while later, depending on your dose. It could be a day later if you get an extremely high dose, or weeks later if you don't ha if you get just above that 410 or right around that 410. And what happens is. Uh, the radiation will destroy your bone marrow, which means you can no longer produce um, white blood cells or red blood cells, so you're unable to fight off infection. Um, that's why you can die without medical intervention. We can give you, um, we can do some things to treat the, the nausea, um, we can also give you antibiotics to help fight off infection. However, if you get a, a really bad dose, um, your intestines can actually start leaking, as will your blood vessels, um, and you'll die that way at a very painful death. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, if you've seen the Chernobyl miniseries on HBO um, back in 2019, really good um, miniseries. Um, you see the firefighters, they go respond to the uh, exposed reactor that exploded. Um, they are in the presence of um, exposed uranium, getting um, a very lethal dose without knowing it. And you notice they don't immediately um, die. They're actually still fighting the fire for hours. And it's hours later they start getting sick, start getting that nausea and vomiting. They take them to the hospital. Once they take them to the hospital, they seem to recover. Um, the guy's wife comes and visits, visits him. They're playing cards. She's like, oh great, he's gonna be okay. Um, they haven't really told them that it was <laughs> radiation that they're gonna die from. And then later on, um, a day or so later, um, the guy dies a very painful death. Um, maybe a little over dramatized here um, with like his eyes not working and things like that. But that's kind of what happens. So you, you get exposed, you don't know it, you get sick, you go recover, you think you're fine, and then you die. Right, so that's, that's why it's important to have that radiation meter so you know, oh wow, I got a really high dose, I need to start antibiotics right away and see what we can do um, before it's too late. Um, so when you do get exposed to radiation, it's not just the amount of radiation you get exposed to, but it's how quickly you get that dose. All right? So it's amount of radiation and the time you receive that dose. Um, so most of our doctrine back from the Cold War uses the centigray, right? It's little c, big G, little y, you can see there on the slides. Um, that is the SI unit of measuring radiation. Um, it's equal, a centigray is equal to a rad, if you've heard that before. But there's lots of ways to measure radiation. Um, so you might see it measured other ways in other places, but in Army doctrine, um, in fact, all DOD doctrine uses the centigray. Um, but if you get a small dose of radiation, your body can recover given enough time. In fact, we're all constantly being exposed to uh, radiation from cosmic rays and radon in the ground. Um, but it's a small dose and our body has time to recover, so we're not, no, no one's going to die from those kinds of exposures. All right? um, but if you get exposed and you don't die and you don't get a fatal dose, but then you get exposed the next day or a couple days later, your body hasn't had time to recover and that will accumulate and you get an extra dose of radiation. Um, so the way that we track radiation in the Department of Defense is we use something called a RES category, which stands for Radiation Exposure St uh, Status. Um, this all comes back from Cold War Doctrine, all right? Um, and you can see there, we have, there's three RES categories. Um, there's RES 1, RES 2, and then RES 3 I've kind of split up a little bit more um, just to kind of delineate what you're going to see based on that uh, exposure. Um, so 1 to 74 centigrade is considered res category 1. Um, and you can see by doctor and we say that you have mild effects within a day. So within 24 hours, you're going to be a little nauseous, probably not even going to vomit. Um, you're going to have no long-term effects. You're going to be just fine. Now once you get above 75, 75 to 124, the, the light blue category there, that's res category 2, you're going to have slight illness within a day. So instead of mild effects, you're getting illness, so you are probably going to vomit 12 to 24 hours later. You're going to vomit, have diarrhea, just feel terrible. 
You're going to want to be on limited duty because you're not going to feel like going out and walking a couple, you know, a couple miles, all right, or doing your normal soldier tasks, all right. And you notice here it says no further exposure permitted. Now, if you notice, look back down at rest category one, it doesn't say no further exposure permitted. So it's okay if you get less than 74 to get another small dose, right? It wasn't until you get above 75 that the DOD says, hey, we should really keep you from getting any further exposure. All right, now once we move to a res category three, we're gonna start in the, the yellow category there, 125 to 299. So you're gonna get your illness and your weakness within a day. So we're looking at definitely within 24 hours, probably closer to 12 to 18 hours. And you see there it says five to 10% premature death. Now that's just cancer. So that means you will get cancer down the road. Five to 10% of the people will, um, less than 300 centigrade. Um, but the remainder will cover, and again, no further exposure permitted. Now we move up to the orange category, right? Still res category three. That's 300 to 529. All right. Now this is illness and weakness within half a day. So in six to 12 hours, you are gonna have that vomiting, you're gonna have that diarrhea, you're gonna have that nausea, you're gonna have that malaise. Now you're gonna see the chance of cancer is gonna increase up to 50% now. All right, and again, the remainder will recover, and again, no further exposure, because it will just add on to that and put, bump you up to higher and higher categories. Now once we move to the red, it's red because that's bad, right? 5.30 to 7.99 is um, immediate, or sorry, is incapacitation within an hour. So this is uh, really close to, you're gonna be down, you're not gonna be able to do anything, you will be combat ineffective, you see that there in red, right? Within the hour, so 30 minutes to an hour, you're gonna be dropping, you're not gonna be able to hold your weapon and fight, you're done for, all right? You are sick, and you see five to 90% of people will die within four to six weeks, right? We're no longer looking at, Cancer percentage, we're looking at your death down the road within uh, you know, four to six weeks, and it's gonna be a very painful death. Um, now, once we get to 800 to 1,000, and then it's just even worse above 1,000, all right? Um, it's black, um, that's immediate incapacitation. You're gonna drop immediately. You're gonna know, even though you can't see it, um, that you are exposed to a, a very lethal dose of radiation. Um, you're gonna be combat ineffective again. You're just gonna drop on the ground. Um, and 95% of people will die within two to three weeks. And there's really nothing we can do at that point, except try to make it a little less painful uh, as you, um, uh, your body deals with that radiation. Now, just to kind of give you an idea, uh, most people are very unfamiliar with radiation and um, you know, what, how does this matter? What is one, what is 74, how does that matter? Um, so we're gonna look at just some events and kind of convert these into centigrades for what you've been exposed to normally in your life for radiation, right? So if you get a chest x-ray, if you go to the doctor, that's about 0 0.01 centigrades. That's a very small amount. Um, you can see there in, in the US, the average um, annual radon um, exposure is 0.228, so like 0.3 centigrade. Right? We haven't even got to one yet. Um, you got to get a whole body CT scan to get to a centigrade. And by OSHA standards, right, um, uh, nuclear workers are only allowed to get five centigrades of radiation per year. Once they hit that max of five, they have to stop so their body has time to recover so that they don't ever um, get to a point where they're going to get cancer. Now you notice five is what we say, hey, a, a, a radiation worker that works around stuff all his life shouldn't get more than five. That's starting to get dangerous. You notice for the military, right, we say up to 74, you know, that's still res category one. We don't even say no further exposure permitted, right? If, you know, if possible, you wouldn't ever want to get exposed, right? But by doctrine and risk categories, we don't even say that um, because we're looking at, um, you know, an immediate combat mission. Right, so we're looking, this, the res categories are really to help commanders determine the risk of further exposure to their troops to continue the fight because, hey, we've got to keep fighting if these are used on the battlefield. All right, so you notice we have a little higher tolerance for radiation and um, really the reason it was 75 um, is because 75, um, to make that jump from res category one to res category two, back in uh, the 50s and 60s, 75 was the first point from a blood test that we would see your white blood cell count drop enough to know that you were exposed because if we didn't have a, a, a detector to notice that you were exposed. So that's why it's 75. All right, so moving on, that's radiation. All right, just kind of the invisible killer of the nuclear blast, if you will. All right, so now we're gonna move to blast. This is the one that uh, is pretty common for those of us in the, in the military, right? So we're gonna get a blast 
pressure wave, right? So you're going to get both over pressure, which causes structural collapse, damages your organs, pops your eardrums, right? If you get enough, it could rupture your lungs, all right? And we're also going to get a dynamic pressure, that blast wave moving out, that's going to do translational effects or really strong wind. That's going to cause shrapnel, that's going to pick things up and throw them across the room. So not only could your, you know, lungs be crushed, but your body could be picked up, thrown against the wall. Um, Another way you could die. This also, the dynamic pressure is what rolls over vehicles. All right, so I'm going to show a video here of the explosion from 2020 of Beirut. I think uh, pretty familiar in a lot of our uh, minds still. Now, I want to point out, you see there in red, this is not a nuclear detonation, right? Not a nuclear detonation. This is ammonium nitrate, which is a fertilizer that is used, uh, you can make an explosive, all right? But it, it's been estimated to be somewhere around a kiloton. You see between 0.5 and 1.5, just because we're kind of scientists and we have error bars on things. But it's about a kiloton. So this is the best example of in a modern city, what would a kiloton size detonation do and what would it look like, right? Obviously, this, is, this doesn't have the thermal, this doesn't have the radiation effects, right? But it does have the blast effects. Now, just to kind of phrase this before we watch the video, um, this is roughly estimated about 2,700 tons all right, of ammonium nitrate that exploded. That's an entire warehouse, all right, which is a volume of about 4,000, a little over 4,000 cubic meters, all right, of ammonium nitrate. This is a lot of stuff. So if we move on, we're looking at some pictures here of the aftermath of this explosion. All right, so the, the large picture on the left, you can see looking down of where the detonation happened, you can see a crater there. That crater is about 120 meters in diameter, about 43 meters deep kind of true, about the same as what you would see after a nuclear detonation. Um, but you'll notice that everything near that detonation is pretty much destroyed, right? Even the silos that were right there, I, I don't think they're usable, but they didn't completely collapse. And you see a lot of uh, the steel framed, right, thinly um, steel framed um, warehouses that were nearby and the containers are all, you know, demolished. But the rest of the city, right, a little ways out, kind of we see that like bridge almost a little bit in the distance. And then the rest of the city is still there and still fine. Even some of the like three-story buildings behind the uh, grain silos are still standing. All right. So if a detonation were to go off of this size, about a kiloton or so, right, in a city, you're not going to destroy the entire city. You're only going to damage a small portion of that city. All right. And again, as the, as the blast wave moves out and hits the other buildings, those buildings are going to absorb a lot of that energy and, and reduce it even further. So if you can kind of compare this back to uh, images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those cities were completely leveled, whereas here it's not that bad, all right? And that's partly because those cities back in, in you know, World War II era Japan were mostly wood frame buildings, not you know, steel reinforced concrete, right? So they were much easier to destroy. And if you actually look back at images from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you'll see the few concrete buildings that were made are still standing while the rest of the wood frame buildings are destroyed near ground zero. Now if you look on the top picture, you can see that's the before picture, and you can see the, the warehouse that detonated, and then if you look, that's uh, the second one kind of on that, it, that uh, little pier sticking out, and then if you look down at the bottom right, you can see the, the looking down the aerial view, again, you can see the damage really close by, but then the rest of the city is fine. Now you're going to have a lot of broken glass further out in the city, but the structures are going to be just fine. Now just again, to frame that, again, that was roughly 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate that um, detonated about 4,000, um, a little over 4,000 cubic meters in volume. That's a lot of stuff. Now, just doing um, the math um, as a nuclear engineer for the critical mass of uranium in order to cause a, a detonation, right? Um, just pure uranium-235, we're not talking about a, an actual nuclear weapon, just pure uranium-235, it's about 105 pounds to go nuclear, all right? For pure plutonium-239, it's only 22 pounds. Right, so if you imagine an entire warehouse of ammonium nitrate does this, all right, with pure uranium, that's about, I think, roughly the size of a volleyball or a basketball, about 105 pounds, and then for pure plutonium-239, it's 22 pounds, I think it's roughly about the size of a softball. So that's just the destructive power of these nuclear weapons, um, a lot in, tied up in this, um, inside the nucleus, right, a lot of energy. All right, so again, we've got another of uh, my favorite uh, plots here, right, showing you, again, comparing a 0.1 kiloton to a 10 kiloton, and you notice how quickly the air blast drops off, and the effects don't go nearly as far as they do with um, our light 
um, or our electromagnetic um, effects of thermal and, and the prompt radiation. Um, what you can see there, kind of the table I have in the top right, it compares a one kiloton to a 10 kiloton to a megaton. And you notice going from a one kiloton, it's 0.5 is approximate distance for looking at concrete building damage, right? 0.5 kilometers out to a megaton, it's five kilometers. So that's, you know, a thousand times larger yield. I only get a 10 times larger um, effect in distance, right? And really it's because for blast waves, it's one over the yield to the third power. So it, it's not, again, not making my yield, doubling my yield doesn't double my damage, or a thousand times my yield doesn't make my damage go a thousand times further out. All right, so now we're going to watch a, um, a testing video, right? So back in the 50s when we were testing nuclear weapons, right, we actually had soldiers go out. We would test a, a, a low-yield nuclear weapon, right, from an artillery shell. We would shoot it off in the distance, had the soldiers in foxholes at safe distances. The detonation would go off, and it would be a fallout-free high burst. So there was no fallout. They would then exit their foxholes and walk forward to ground zero and they had staged some tanks and vehicles and dummies and um, uniforms so that the soldiers would see what it would look like after a blast and what they would expect to see flipped over tanks and you know dummies on fire and uniforms kind of give them that idea of wow this is pretty devastating close by but I wasn't that far away and I was just fine all right helping them reduce the psychological impacts of seeing um, the aftermath of a nuclear detonation a big deal after this nuclear weapon goes off and it's not just game over man and we're all dead and the atmosphere's on fire and you know ah we just give up no we got to keep fighting through right that's what's important about understanding nuclear weapons is these lower yield are not going to kill everyone and you can continue your mission anyways all right so Looking at the casualties, kind of what we've talked about, the three main effects, right? The blast, the, the thermal radiation, and the prompt radiation, right? Those are all different ways you can die, and they kind of overlap each other. So if you're close to that weapon, you're not going to die one way. You're going to die multiple ways. Now, we haven't talked about folly yet. That's next, right? But what I do want to show is, again, back to ATP 4-02.83. This is the predicted distribution of injuries you would experience from a nuclear detonation. So you can see most of the injuries are going to be in that bottom section, that combined injury section. And when you see wounds, that's the, that's the air blast, that's the shrapnel coming from air blast. But you can see there that 40% of the people are going to be damaged. Most of the casualties are going to come from radiation and burns. Now, just to kind of go back to Hiroshima, right, we talked about this at the very beginning, those distances, you'll see that going the furthest out is the thermal radiation, all right, and then the prompt radiation is, 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 further, is the second furthest reaching one, right, at 1.2 kilometers, right? So what that means is I'm going to get irradiated, not be able to fight infections, and I'm going to get third degree burns, which kills all, burns all of the skin, right, all layers of my skin, and I need a skin graft to fix that. That won't heal on its own. And, oh, by the way, one of the worst problems with burn injuries, right, and that's why hospitals have special burn units, right, is because of the risk of infection. So not only am I risk of infection because I've burned my skin, but now I can't fight off that infection because the radiation has killed my blood cells, right, my white blood cells. So that's why, you know, we've got to start thinking not only about what are the effects could they do, but also what kind of injuries could I expect and what kind of uh, capabilities do I need to have to be able to respond to those kinds of casualties. All right, so now we're going to move on to fallout, my favorite part. This is actually what I got my PhD in, fallout, all right? So if the fireball, right, touches the ground, so it actually is close enough to the ground. We saw that first video, it didn't touch the ground, but if it were to touch the ground, right, the soil, anything else, buildings, tanks, whatever, people, they will be vaporized, immediately turned into a gas, all right? And they'll pull it into that fireball and they mix around with everything in the fireball. Again, this lasts for about two seconds after detonation, right, the fireball does before it's cooled. Um, and again, it's about 100 million degrees Celsius, so close to like the center of the sun. All right, so the vaporized soil mixes with what we call the radioactive fission products, right? So these are all the things that come out of splitting the, uro the uranium or the plutonium. When I split those two atoms, I get smaller atoms out that are radioactive, right? We call those the fission products, all right? So these radioactive atoms will mix with that vaporized soil, for instance, all right? And as that soil begins to condense, turn back into solid soil, like dirt particles, after about two to three seconds, all right? If it's mixed with that radioactive fission product, I now have a radioactive piece of dirt. And as that dirt gets bigger and bigger in the cloud and gets to a larger and larger particle, eventually gravity is gonna win and it's gonna get pulled out of the cloud, out of that, you know, 
if you think about any detonation you've ever seen, you get a lot of dust right coming out. Eventually that dust falls to the ground. It's called fallout because it falls out of the sky when gravity wins, right? So we get a lot of the heavier, more radioactive products are closer to ground zero and the lighter particles will blow further downwind and deposit downwind. Typically the fallout is all deposited within about two and a half hours, depending on the wind speed, all right? And we have that fallout just on the ground, radioactive dirt that is then irradiating you and causing a problem. Now, if we jump back to that video I showed earlier, right, where we had no fallout, what happens to those radioactive fission products? They don't fall because they stay as individual atoms floating in the sky. And they just continue to float and they spread out, all right, and they remain in the atmosphere. So a lot of our, um, atmos our testing that we did above ground that was fallout free, fallout safe, right, those radioactive fission products remained in the atmosphere. They decayed away to stable elements and are still in the atmosphere to this day. Now just to point out, for both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we knew about fallout and we didn't want to have that longer term radiation on the ground, so we actually targeted our weapons at a fallout free height of burst or a fallout safe height of burst, meaning we made sure that the weapon detonated at a distance higher off the ground than the fireball would be so the fireball did not contact the ground and cause any fallout. So at both of those locations, people were able to move right back in within a day or two, right, once the fires had been put out. They're able to move back in without any radiation um, concerns. Now, fallout is not a long-term issue for the military. You notice issue for the military is in red there because for the military, for military operations, fallout is not a long-term issue like a lot of people think, right? Common misconception is that fallout makes the downwind area uninhabitable for many, many years, hundreds of years, right? A lot of people always think back to the radio, the accident in Chernobyl, right? That still has an exclusion zone of 35 kilometers around um, Chernobyl and people aren't supposed to be there, right? Not supposed to live there, right? And it was such a huge thing, right? Well, there's a little bit of a difference between what happened in Chernobyl what happens to a nuclear weapon, right? So just to kind of give you why that is, right? In Chernobyl, it was 192 tons of uranium that was exposed when the reactor exploded. Right, a nuclear weapon, we talked about this earlier. If I'm looking at just by the math, pure uranium-235, that is 105 pounds to go critical, right, and have a nuclear detonation. So 192 tons exposed in Chernobyl, that's a lot. 105 pounds out of a nuclear bomb, not that much, right? So uh, the amount of stuff released that was dangerous is much higher in Chernobyl. And also, Chernobyl wasn't all a nuclear bomb that fissions instantly, right, or within nanoseconds, all right? And, and it's just I, my decay products in Chernobyl, we still have uranium that's out there that's exposed. In fact, they took off like the top three meters of dirt to try to capture all that uranium that was exposed, but there is still some. So that's why Chernobyl is still a problem versus a nuclear weapon that's really not that bit as big of a deal for the military. All right? and in fact, most of those radioactive fission products or those atoms that come out of splitting the uranium or plutonium have very short half-lives and decay, decay away relatively quickly. All right? In fact, for less than 100 kilotons, or in fact 100 kilotons and less, all right, most of the radioactivity for the military risk is gone within two days. All right? so, why can I say this, right? Again, nuclear engineer, got to do a little bit of science, all right? If you look here, this is one of over 200 possible reactions when I split uranium. It's kind of a random thing that happens, all right? But when I split the uranium, the green circle there, right, uranium-235, you see that uranium has a half-life, or half of it decays away every 700 million years. So it takes a long time to decay away. It just stays there constantly being um, dangerous, all right? Now you see the yellow box there. Typically, we say that after about 10 half-lives, we cut everything in half, and then in half, and then in half, and then in half, and then in half, right? 10 times, it's mostly gone. You can assume that it's, it's decayed away, all right? So that would take 7 billion years to get rid of uranium. That's a long time. But when I split it, you see that in the bottom there, the orange decay chain, right? It goes strontium, yttrium, and then zirconium, right? That is... 75 seconds for the first one, the strontium-94 there. 75 second half-life. So in 12 minutes, it's all decayed away to the next thing, the yttrium, which is 19 minutes. So in three hours, it's, it's all decayed away, and then it's stable, right? So then it's not an issue anymore. Same thing when we go to the xenon, right? We go through 14 seconds, 64 seconds. That's why I'm saying these relatively decay away pretty quickly, all right? You see the, the barium-140 is about 13 days. That takes four months to go through 10 half-lives. All right, so that's a while, so that, that could be an issue, all right? And then the lanthanum is um, about 40 hours, that's about 
half a month before it's gone, but then I'm stable. So you can see these decay away relatively quickly. All right, and, and again, I'm taking my uranium and I'm splitting it. It's not necessarily going down this path. There's over 200 possible options. Some of them to have much faster decay chains. So what does this all mean? So here I have a representative plot of a fallout um, field that you would see after a detonation. You see the top graph there, the little plus sign kind of on the left, that is the target location. All right, and you can see I have these just generic ovals that kind of represent what it would look like if I had a wind blowing from west to east, right, blowing to the east. So the fall is being blown to the east. Um, and you can see there we have the blue oval is for 25 centigrade. It's kind of the limit for the um, civilian first responders what their maximum exposure can be before they have to get pulled out. Um, the green is 75 centigrade. Again, that's res category one for the military, right? Below 75, right? We're good, all right? Um, yellow is the combat emergency risk up to 125, right? That's the max we're supposed to go um, before we say don't get any more radiation, all right? And then red is that 410 where you first get that chance of uh, getting a lethal um, dose, right? So that top graph there, what that's showing is, if I were to be at outside in the open, this is for a 10 kiloton detonation, if I am outside in the open, exposed, have no shielding, all right, the detonation goes off, I stand in place for two full days, what would be my total dose that I would receive? Didn't move, based on my location from ground zero. You can see the, the follow plume goes out to beyond 50 kilometers. It's about 50 kilometers long, right, and about a little less than 10 kilometers wide. Um, north and south here. So you can see you do have some risk. That looks pretty bad. But if you kind of look down at the bottom left graph, that is 12 hours showing up 12 hours after detonation. So the bomb goes off, 12 hours later I show up, and I stand in place out in the open for eight hours. Now that graph all fits in the little, the black box up on the top graph. Right, so it's shrunk considerably if I'm only there for eight hours, right? You see I have just about a kilometer long um, red there in the bottom left, uh, from left to right, a kilometer and a little like less than half a kilometer north and south, all right? So really, at that point you can see, wow, that's not that bad, and that's standing in place for eight hours out in the open. So if I'm in a vehicle, that's going to go down because I'm not going to be as exposed. And again, this is all exposure to the dirt on the ground that's irradiating me or on anything that's around, right? Just the dirt will settle on any, on any flat surface, basically. All right, now if you move to the middle graph on the bottom, you see that's showing up 24 hours after detonation. Again, standing for eight hours, right? You notice there's no more red, there's no more lethal risk after 24 hours. That's, again, if I stay there for longer than eight hours, I might start getting that, but typically if a detonation has gone off, unless it was you know, on something I need to go recover, like a, a base or something, I need to get the equipment out of there, right? If it's just out in the middle of the battlefield, I can walk, you know, what is that, 10 less than 10 kilometers, nine kilometers long, I can walk nine kilometers in eight hours. Right, if I, had to, if I was walking east to west for some reason, but I could just walk around it, right? Um, and then if you look at the far right graph, that's two days later after detonation, again, staying for eight hours, you see it's shrunk so small, there's hardly anything other than the blue, right? The, the yellow, right, the combat risk is, is tiny, right? So what that's showing you is that the fallout for the military, for military operations, right, where I'm not standing in place for a long time, the fallout goes away very, very quickly. Now, if I want to go live back right next to that, say it blew up near my house and I wanted to go move back in, right, within a kilometer of my house, that's going to be a long time before I get to a point where I can, by like, you know, safety reasons and OSHA standards, I could say I could go back and live there. That'd be years before I go back and say, I'm not going to get radiation that could potentially cause me cancer over the time of my lifetime, right, if I'm living there forever. So I probably wouldn't want to move back there, but if I'm doing military operations, I can get in and get out very easily. And you can see how quickly that shrinks, a, a slight tactical pause, and then it's safe to cross. It's really not like I'm going to do fallout and make an area uninhabitable for years or unusable. And if you have a radiation detector, right, with your unit, you can easily turn that on and as you get close to the fallout, it'll start pinging you and let you know you've got some radiation and you can just move around, right? All right. So that's fallout, right? Not as bad as you probably thought it was, right? Not the post-apocalyptic future that we always see in movies. Now, finally, I'm going to talk about the electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. Right, this is one that people oftentimes have a lot of questions about, all right, because we see all this stuff in Hollywood, right, and think it's so terrible and we're going to get sent back to the Stone Age. Um, probably not. All right, so how does EMP work? So first off, we're going to look at what we call a high altitude EMP, right, where we have a blast greater than 20 kilometers in the atmosphere. All right, so when I have a weapon go off, 
up in space, I get an EMP on the ground. And really that works from two things, it's what we call it E1 and E3. So first we're going to talk about E1 because this is the one that matters to military units. All right. When high energy gamma rays, I got a, a cool little image here to help you out. So when a burst goes off 20 kilometers or greater in space, all right, the gamma rays travel in all directions, but some of them move back towards the Earth, and they're going to hit atoms in the air and knock off electrons off those air molecules. Now these electrons get knocked off based on this high energy gamma at near the speed of light. And if they're up in the atmosphere, we have the Earth's magnetic field acting. And if you remember anything from high school physics, right, you know, it's like charged particles. I was a chemistry major in high school or in college, so, you know, it's either right hand rule or left hand rule, but charged particles on a curved surface, uh, on a magnetic field will curve, right? So that's what we're trying to show here is these charged electrons moving at near the speed of light will spin because of the Earth's magnetic field causing them to produce singleton radiation, basically a giant pulse of electricity down, well actually in all directions, but some of it's directed down to the Earth's surface there, you can see in the red arrow. All right, now why does it have to be between 20 and 40 kilometers there? Well that's the Goldilocks zone, if you will, of air density. Greater than 40 kilometers, there's really not any air molecules, so the gamma rays just travel through the vacuum of space until they hit something between 20 to 40. Below 20 kilometers, air is too dense, and as those electrons are knocked off, before they can start spinning, they're typically absorbed by other um, air molecules, and they kind of quenches the, e, the E1 field from happening, or the E1 pulse from happening. So that's why the sweet spot is kind of 20 to 40 kilometers there. Now this pulse lasts for less than a second, it's faster than a lightning bolt, and this will cause damage potentially to your electronic equipment. All right. Now the other pulse that comes out that's often discussed when you talk about EMP, or if you go look this up um, on the internet or something, you're going to see something about E3. Okay. Now E3, got another image for you here. This is after the detonation happens. Is that those fission products and the hot fireball, right? Heat rises, so it's going to rise through whatever little bit of air there is, and as it rises through the Earth's magnetic field, those charged particles that are those fission products, they're they're charged. They're actually going to cause the Earth's magnetic field to distort, which I'm trying to show there with the blue lines in the image. And that distortion actually induces electric fields in long straight conductors, things that are a kilometer or longer, like power lines. So it can build up charge in those power lines, which they can move down the power line and short out a transformer, knock out civilian power companies or power issues. All right? Not really an issue for the military because we don't have anything that's a long straight kilometer or more of a conductor. Right? None of our equipment is that big or that long. So really E3 is more of a civilian issue, whereas E1 is what we worry about in the military. You might be asking yourself, what about E2? Well, E2 is just like a lightning pulse. It's all of our, um, it's kind of similar to E1, but not as bad, and it's slow enough that our normal like search protectors will protect against that, and, and not, it doesn't cause a problem. So typically it's just E1 and E3. So now that we understand what EMP is, we're going to look a little bit about it, all right? So it's really not as, not a factor for near surface bursts, and why we see that is, that, you know, we talked about high altitude EMP, right? Now if we talk about l near the surface, so anything close to the ground where I'm going to have any of those effects we've already discussed, all right? That's, we get something called source region EMP, all right? Now it will affect equipment near ground zero and near where the blast goes off. That's what GZ stands for on the slide there, ground zero. But it's all within a kilometer and the real strong fields are all going to be very close to ground zero, well within all of the other effects we've already talked about, well within that thermal, well within that prompt radiation, and within that blast. So likely if your radios have issues, you're also going to be, you know, thermally irradiated, 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 and you're going to have blast effects. So EMP is going to be kind of your last worry in that case. All right, but it can cause problems to electronics, circuits, um, microelectronics, things like that. So if you follow the EMP mill standards for hardness, right, that should get around those effects, right? Um, you put your things in uh, Faraday cages, uh, turn off some of your equipment, it has to be powered on to have an EMP, all right? Um, but really what we're trying to talk about here with EMP is it's not a definite effect. EMP is a very stochastic or random effect when it happens. So sometimes your radios will get a disruption, which is just like tripping the circuit breaker. They will power off. All you got to do is turn them back on, they'll boot up, they'll work just fine. Right? It won't actually damage them. You get some damage, all right? but again, it's stochastic. It's not always the same every time. 
Right? And one of the things with the disruption right, is your radio might get disrupted. That's easy. I turn it off. I turn it on. It reboots. Everything's fine. But what could happen is it could be I might have a network of systems all connected. And I have to go through each system as I turn on my radio. My radio works. Something's still wrong. And then I go to the next thing. Maybe it's this switch. Nope, that works. Oh, maybe it's this router. Oh, here was the problem. So it might take a while to determine what actually caused the problem, what actually was disrupted as I turn things on and off and power cycle them. And then it might be, you know, that thing is disrupted and might turn back on or it might be damaged and I have to replace it. So if you're, you know, in an, a chance of having an EMP, right, it's very important to have your critical equipment backed up or with spares that are powered off so that they don't have, you have a replacement if you have an EMP effect. Now, if we jump back to high altitude EMP, right, that high altitude EMP detonation, that altitude of 20 kilometers or greater, can have an effect over a large area because it's kind of line of sight from up in space where that EMP effect goes. So just kind of to illustrate this, back in 1962, the last atmospheric test we did was a starfish prime test. It was actually 1.44 megatons. And they set it off 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface, out in the Pacific, right out kind of over nothing. It actually was about 900 miles away from Hawaii. Now, when the weapon detonated, about 900 miles away on Hawaii, right in the middle of the night, about 300 streetlights got knocked out. All right, and some burglar alarms went off. Now, back, think back to the 60s, right? We didn't have a lot of microelectronics, things that would have had EMP effects, so it could have been worse if they were to do that today, right? But it wasn't like, you know, we didn't knock out every, all power and everything, right? It was just a small amount. So if you've ever seen Ocean's Eleven and they do the EMP to knock out power in the Vegas Strip, right? Eh, that's a little overestimated, right? Th thanks, Hollywood. You always do that to us, all right? Now, I do have a picture if you're kind of wondering, like, what would it look like? So this is actually from Hawaii, looking at that detonation. This is the middle of the night. That looks like the sun is up right through the clouds, 900 miles away, 400 kilometers up. That's what a nuclear uh, blast would look like out in space. Right? Now, kind of, you know, made sense to EMP things back when we didn't have a lot of satellites, but now that we have a whole lot of satellites in space, there's other things we have to worry about if we're trying to do that high altitude EMP. What about the effects to things in space and satellites? Right? So really I'm kind of representing four of the effects that could happen if you do a nuclear weapons detonation out in space. The first is just prompt radiation effects. So that is any satellites within line of sight of that detonation. Right? We get gamma rays, we get the, the thermal pulse, we also get potentially some fragmentation from the casing of the, of the device itself, right? the nuclear weapon itself, that can travel out and hit those satellites. Now the gamma rays can actually hit the satellite and induce software glitches, turn a single zero to a one in the binary code of that satellite, causing it to stop working correctly. Right? It can cause power failure, mess up the solar panels. All right? We also have something called system generated EMP, which is represented by the little lightning bolt at number two there on the bottom right satellite. All right? So SGIMP, as we like to um, use the acronym, all right, is when the radiation, right, from the gamma radiation from the blast hits a satellite, right? Just like it knocked off electrons in the air, right, in the atmosphere, it can actually knock off electrons on the surface of that satellite. Now, those satellites are made of metal, typically, so they're good conductors. So those electrons will all kind of move around the surface of the satellite and collect, build up a charge, which then can then travel inside the satellite and short out um, parts of the satellite, causing um, disruption or loss of the satellite, which could be a problem. Right now, besides the immediate effects, right, the direct line of sight effects, we also have a couple of delayed effects. First is belt pumping, represented by my radioactive green cloud there. Right? So when my weapon detonates, I still get those fission products. They're not going to become fallout because they're not mixing with the ground because it was at a fallout free height of burst, definitely up in space. Right? But those fallout uh, fission product, or sorry, those fission products, not fallout, but the fission products are still um, charged particles, so they are affected by the Earth's magnetic field. They kind of get trapped there in the Earth's magnetic field as they decay away over time. Now, if we do this close to the Earth's surface, right, we have a lot of satellites in like low Earth orbit or like the International Space Station, for instance, is in low Earth orbit, and it orbits the Earth every, roughly every 90 minutes. It goes around the Earth. So if it travels every 90 minutes through that cloud of radioactive fission product, every 90 minutes, the astronauts are getting dosed with a amount, all that fallout right there every time they go through. So they're getting exposed to a high amount of radiation every 90 minutes. Same thing with the satellites as they traverse through that area. 
Most satellites are, have some kind of radiation hardness for cosmic radiation, being out in space and not having the atmosphere to protect them. Maybe they have a five-year life, for instance, of um, time for radiation exposure before they will fail. If they're continually, every 90 minutes, going through that belt of radioactive fission products, right, that time might go from five years down to six months because they're getting way more radiation than they're supposed to. So that's going to affect a lot of satellites. And again, it's, you can't just target just enemy satellites or just, you know, a, an adversary satellite. You're hitting any satellite that goes through that orbit. So you're going to cause a lot of damage to a lot of satellites doing that. And at the same time, you're also going to disrupt comms from the ground up to satellites through that, those radioactive fission products. They will cause problems with uh, communications that try to move through that. So one way around that is just do relays and talk around you know, to another satellite and relay to the satellite you want to talk to, maybe at a higher orbit. But it does cause problems out in space more than just EMP on the ground. All right, so that is all the effects that you can get out of a nuclear weapon. All right, and I hope you see that they are very destructive weapons, right? They have an awesome power um, contained inside the atoms of uranium and plutonium that we have learned to harness. However, they're not going to destroy the entire world with a single nuclear weapon, right? It doesn't set the atmosphere on fire, right? A, a low-yield nuclear weapon used on a battlefield does not end the war, does not stop your mission. You still have to continue your mission. It's very possible that a, a low-yield 10 kilotons or less nuclear weapon used against a for instance, a military battalion, right, is only going to affect a company within that battalion, all right? That battalion doesn't all just go home. They still continue their mission, and that's why it's important to understand these effects. Realize that it's not game over, man. All right, now if you're close, you're going to have a very bad day, right? If you're within those blast radius we kind of talked about, right, that's a very bad day. You're going to die more ways than one, and it's not going to be... It's not going to be painless, right? However, if you're not immediately killed, it's not as bad as Hollywood would like you to believe. All right, so kind of want to just conclude here with this last, this last point, right? If a low-yield nuclear weapon is used on a battlefield, it's still very possible to fight through uh, uh, that nuclear environment and continue your mission. Everyone is not dead, and it's definitely something you can continue on if you know what to expect, and, and it kind of doesn't catch you off guard. Um, so, uh, if you have any further questions, um, you'd like some more information, uh, you can see my email is listed here. Uh, please reach out to me and uh, we can get you uh, more information um, or help you if you'd like to include uh, nuclear weapons in your uh, war games. Thank you very much.